Welcome back to another episode of the Max Term Podcast. As usual, Kyle Stitch here alongside James Finch. Today we're going to be getting into the unrestricted free agent defenseman class, where we've already seen a little bit of movement on that market. Uh, please feel free to follow us, and we'd really appreciate it, at AFP Analytics on Twitter, at Max Term Pod on Twitter. Please subscribe to this podcast channel as well. Any opinions that we kind of are reflecting in this podcast are our own. We both do have a level of connection with people in the industry. We're not necessarily breaking news here or anything. We're, we're offering our insight and opinions on some of these players, trying to give you a little insight into what the free agent market is going to look like, how negotiations might go, things like that, as well as any advertisements you might hear with this podcast do not necessarily reflect James or my views, and we don't necessarily endorse those products. So the unrestricted free agent defenseman class has already started moving with two pretty surprising moves. One contract we're not necessarily surprised with, but probably how it happened is pretty surprising, and one contract that frankly is flooring. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll start with the contract we're not too surprised with. Um, that's Damon Severson, and I, I guess the the... The surprising part of that whole situation was he signed and it was not with New Jersey. It was a sign and trade with Columbus. And that, that's not something I would have foreseen or predicted happening, but um, they seemed to give him the max term and that was enough to convince him to go to Columbus. So eight years at a 6.25 uh, AAV, which is 7.49% of the expected $83.5 million cap. Now, Damon Severson, when we look at him and how we got to our projection, which was uh, a six-year deal at about 6.1 AAV and a 7.3% cap hit percentage, um, some guys sticking out. Mackenzie Weger was a little bit above that. And that was an eight-year deal. Um, Ryan Pulak, an eight-year deal, a little above um, 7.45 cap hit percentage. Um, our deal was really kind of around a, a Tyler Myers, Eric Johnson, Jonas Brodeen, that level of defenseman. So uh, at, at the time of those deals being signed, Probably a, a good number three, or at least perceived to be number three defenseman on teams. Yeah, when when a player like Damon Severson or really anyone's not gonna is gonna basically forego the free agent market. So we're we're just days away from them having the ability to talk to any team. If you're going to choose to give up that option you better get a good contract. You better get something that you're very happy with. So for Damon Severson, he gets eight years max term deal. Vladislav Gavrikov got paid. He got paid, but that it's a short deal. So kind of the opposite of the Severson, where Severson went for the length of the contract, not necessarily as much with the... AAV, at least in our eyes, where Gavrikov went with a short deal, two years, and he was able to get a much higher AAV than we were expecting him to get on a, I believe we had Gavrikov for a five-year deal. So our, our projection was five years at just under 4.9 AAV. That would have been 5.84% of the cap. And he ended up getting a two-year deal at 5.875 AAV, so about $1 million higher per year than we projected. Um, that cap hit percentage, the actual, is 7.04%. What do you think of this Gavrikov deal? I, I I was floored when I saw it. Uh, I went through all the compa all the possible comparable players that kind of our, our projection models spit out. Uh, if you want to learn more about our projection model or kind of why we're using percentage of the caps, we talk we touch on that on um, in our first episode of this po of Max Term podcast. So if you if you if you missed that, feel free to go back and uh, listen to that as well. I was for with Gavrikov's contract. Uh, I looked and looked to try and find a comparison. 
I could find someone that maybe got close to the cap hit percentage, but those were all like six, seven, eight year deals, which if he had done something like that, I would have been surprised, but maybe not shocked. Or, but, and then most of the guys that signed that two year deal were much lower AAVs or, and percentage of the cap. So I, there's really no comparisons. So cap friendly, a great uh, resource tweeted out um, something about there's like four variables in a standard in contract negotiations. And I fully agree with what they're saying here. Value term, signing bonus clauses. Gavrikov checked every single box. That was the cost of the LA Kings telling him, making sure he did not hit that free agent market. Also have to maybe consider a little bit, if he's playing in California, California has a really high state income tax. So that contract's worth a lot less in California than if he could have maybe signed that in some place like Dallas, um, even with Seattle, Vegas, one of the Florida teams, Nashville, where there's no state tax. So maybe there's a level of that needing to be kind of uh, smoothed out as well. But I, I usually it's like, oh, okay, there's a that can't make sense. That's why that contract was signed. I, maybe I don't agree with it, but Gavrikov, I can't point to anyone. So the the closest I can get with a contract is Nikita Nikitin at age 28 with Edmonton. This was signed before free agency in the offseason of 2014. It was a two-year deal, 4.5 AAV. So at that time, it was a 5.5. Four or five percent. That's still much lower percentage-wise. And okay, we were there on the length, but it's not a perfect comparison by any means. And if we flip around the other way and look at the cap hit percentages, that made sense. Like you mentioned, those are all deals that the cap hit percentages of comparables that. Um, match what he actually got, the 7.04%. All these comparables, the deals are at least five years, but mostly six or seven years. There's Eric Johnson, Tyler Myers, Jonas Brodeen, Nate Schmidt. So there aren't really contracts that have really happened in the past decade that make this Gavrikov deal make sense. I think we can talk ourselves into it by breaking down a little bit what kind of the situation is looking at the class as a whole. So uh, we, we touched on the unrestricted free agent forwards in our second episode of the podcast. Feel free to go back and listen to that as well. But in that, we, we said we don't feel comfortable necessarily pinpointing a name that's going to be the top guy paid and there might not be a contract signed over six, seven, eight year, um, eight million dollars for forwards, and the same things really here in defensemen as well. So, looking at some of the defensemen available, we have well at the time Damon Severson was still projected to be available. We have Dmitry Orlov, who's the left shot defenseman. Ryan Graves, the left shot defenseman. Shane Gostaspier, who's the left shot defenseman. And then Brian Dumlin, Eric Gustafson are the next couple left shot defensemen before we get to Ian Cole. Looking at those names, I don't see many guys that are in the same profile as Gavrikov here. No, I, I think that's something that absolutely played into this contract that he got was the Kings saw him as a step above those guys he knew that he could use that to his advantage, or his agent did, at least. And that kind of explains the higher average annual value and the the low length. They wanted him signed before UFA, and that's what it took. And it's interesting. We usually see the uh, right shot guys kind of get that premium. Teams really needing to find that fit. But the LA Kings are stacked, absolutely stacked on the right side. They have a lot of puck movers kind of in the Dmitry Orlov uh, mold. So they were really looking for more of a physical present. But ironically, on the left side, where this year they're just, I think, I see two names, Ryan Graves and uh, Gabrikov, and they stuck with the guy who was familiar and played well in their system. Absolutely. And I think um, part of that is there are 31 other teams that are going to be looking 
to improve their roster. And they're going to see the top of the free agent market. Gavrikov was right up there, and it's not a class that is jumping off the page in quality depth. Um, it, it drops off a little bit, like we mentioned. And um, getting that deal done now, right away, locking it in, the Kings don't have to worry about that spot now. Yeah, if they were kind of left, they would. They, it would have been real easy for them to be kind of left without a chair when or when, when the music stopped. I mean, Ryan Graves, who knows what happens with him. Gavrikov, if if they didn't uh, pull me up now, maybe he, he walks as well. And then they're either trying to have right shot guys play on their offside or go into the trade market and probably still paying a premium for someone that they already could have had and they ended up keeping in Gabrikov. So be interesting to see how that one works out. And he really, and he's going to be able to jump right back in the uh, free agent pool in just a couple of years and probably get a bigger payday. The, the last point I want to make on Gavrikov and you, you hinted at it, the Kings jumping into the trade market, they just traded some bigger assets for Gavrikov. So to let him walk and then to possibly need to go into the trade market again with, they have a great system, uh, a lot of quality prospects, but they just moved some bigger assets for Gavrikov. Are, are you looking to do that again right away? Probably not. So keeping them in house was important. And then they and then they used the fact that he was already well. They used some of the moves leading up to signing him where they also unloaded some defensemen as well. So they 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 made the space for him. So sure, if you want to be an economist and say, yeah, it's a sunk cost, they already spent the pick, they shouldn't let that drive future decisions. But the reality is perception matters. And they gave up a first-round pick to get him and Corpus Allo and still exit in the first round of the playoffs. You can't, you can't be just churning rentals out it and exiting in the first round if you're the GM, if you're running that team, because then your fans are going to start getting upset real quick. Ownership's not going to be real happy either. Kings do have a, a lot of depth in their system, so they do have a little runway to play with there, though. Absolutely. And honestly, if if I'm these other top guys on the free agent market, I like what I see with the Severson deal, and I like what I see with the Gavrikov deal. I think it does nothing but add more money to their pockets. Yeah, we, we definitely got a little nervous after Gavrikov signing with our with our uh, kind of accuracy with these projections. We're like, if he's setting that level of market for these defense, and what are some of the other guys getting? But I think I think Damon Severson settling rate where he did might push things up a little bit. So we have Dmitry Orlov projected five years, um, 6.3 million AAV, that might go up a little bit, but he's also a 32-year-old defenseman, and I don't know if there's going to be a lot of teams wanting to sign on for five more years for someone that age. What can be tough, I think, is it seems like each year the guys who perform well towards the end of the season, whether it's the end of the regular season or the playoffs or both, that really helps them out contract-wise. And when he went from Washington, where he wasn't having his greatest season, goes to Boston and just absolutely lights it up and is performing like a number one defenseman for Boston, that's going to work well in his favor. Yeah, I Dimitri Orlov is a player I've always kind of been a fan of as a puck-moving defenseman. He kind of fits the way the NHL is moving. Would have been really interesting if he was a few years younger, what type of contract he would have gotten um, as a free agent. But he fit really well in Boston. I don't know if they're going to have the cap space to bring him back. So be he's going to be an interesting name out there as probably the far and away best defenseman available. Absolutely, and I think a little bit further down um, as far as the AAV is concerned, but right under him on the list of available defensemen is Ryan Graves. Uh, Graves is more of a definite second pair defenseman, but that isn't to say that he couldn't complement a much more offensive star defenseman on a top pair. 
yeah, every team's looking for that stay-at-home guy. And, uh, I mean, if you want to stay at home guy, Ryan Graves certainly fits it. But I, I like some of the names further down the list, personally. Not left shots, but maybe the more premium right shots guys. I mean, Scott Mayfield, Racco Gudis, even maybe Justin Hole. Sorry, Toronto fans, that that didn't work out at the end. But he, he's shown that he can be kind of that more stay at home calming factor. There's some, there's some really interesting names. Mayfield, Gudis, Hole as uh, right shot guys that could slot really easily into a second pair and uh, provide some really good depth for some teams. Yeah, I, I think w- when we look at this list of the UFA defensemen, that really seems like where the value lies, is that second pair, maybe even very strong third pair guys that are the stay-at-home defensemen. Um a way to look at this is would you rather have uh, Ryan Graves on a five-year, let's call it 5.1 AAV, or would you rather sign someone like Radko Gudis on a three-year deal at 3.3? What you might be getting is a little different, but I don't know if it's that much different that you'd say, ah, yeah, I'll, I'll spend two extra million a year and another two years to get Graves, you might look at that and say, I kind of like the Gudis value. It saves me a decent amount of money that I could spend elsewhere. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely at the let's get two guys for that the price of one in this situation. I mean, a Gudis, a Mayfield should should be able to slot right onto a second pair or as or third pair and, and get one of those guys and then fill out your third fourth line depth. I mean we. I, I'll always go back to it. We just watched the Vegas Golden Knights team absolutely throttle Florida by just rolling line after line after line after line, and there was no weaknesses. There was no letting up. And I think some of the teams that exited earlier in this playoffs just didn't have that same strength that uh, Vegas did. So if I'm a team and I can save a couple million and get a very similar player who maybe just doesn't have the same, you know, prestige and box score numbers I'm absolutely doing that yeah I definitely agree and it it could come down to what where is the hole on the defense for x team Um, do they need that more elite offensive ability I don't know if I want to say elite but what Orlov brings offensively is definitely more than what Radko Gudis would bring. But if you already have someone in that role where you would slide someone like Orlov into and you have the hole a little bit more down the defensive lineup, there's not a real reason to use all that cap space up on Dmitry Orlov, get the value player in Radko Gudis and use that money elsewhere. Or maybe you can, uh, pardon the bad joke here, plug that hole with Justin Hole. Yeah, I honestly, I, I'm more of a fan of Justin Hole than uh, Toronto fans are at this point, but I don't know if I like him quite as much as a Gudis or a Mayfield, but it is still definitely a solid option. I think uh, there's 23 players that were on the Toronto Maple Leafs roster this year that we're both probably more of fans of than their fans are right now anyways, so... That's definitely true, but they do want their core four to stick around, I think. We'll see. We'll see what they do in Toronto. But, uh, yeah, Justin Hole, not the best player in the fans' eyes. Yeah, he's he's a player that probably even if you're just trying to shake things up in Toronto, he's going to hit the market. And being a right shot player, Justin Hole, as Justin Hole is, he's he's there's going to be a market for him. I I like our three I like our three by three basically projection there for him. Um, but another interesting kind of right shot guy right around that 3 million range, but maybe the complete opposite style defenseman, Kevin Shattenkirk. Yeah, he's the fun one because he's kind of a forgotten defenseman, I feel like, in the past couple of years. Ever since he went to Anaheim, I mean, they haven't been too good in recent years. And it's I sometimes look at this list and I'm like, oh yeah, Kevin Shattenkirk, he's, he's still playing. He's not necessarily... A, old he is towards the end of his career he'll be going to age 34 
he should be a bottom pair guy, but he can still provide value if you need, say, a second power play defenseman or a defenseman to man your second power play. I, th- I think he's still very capable of that. Yeah, after after we get like looking at Shat and Kirk, Ian Cole is has been around a long time. There's some other issues that I wouldn't necessarily touch there if I'm a team. Um, Carson Soucy is a nice depth player. Luke Shen could be interesting. Troy Stetcher, but then I don't love the names after that really, unless Alex Edler is available, which I'm just not thinking. I'm feeling like he's either staying about where he is or or hanging it up at this point. If you miss out, if you need a defenseman, you miss out on kind of one of those bigger names. I don't know where you're going. Yeah, it's kind of hard when when you look at a bottom pair. Uh, you tend to find guys there that you're either not wanting them on the ice at all, or they play specific roles for you. Maybe they're a strong penalty killer, and I think there's guys that you could plug in on that bottom pair where you are happy you have them on your team. They play a very strong penalty kill role, or they are your uh, defenseman on the second power play unit. But there aren't a lot of those guys in this free agent class. Um, the depth here isn't great. Uh, you, you start to get to like a Dmitry Kulikov. Not a player I would really be targeting at this point. Those Ian Coles, Kevin Shattenkirk, a Carson Soucy, he's a good penalty kill defenseman. Those level of players, that's your ideal bottom pair. Once we go below that on this list, it gets a little more shaky. And I think there's going to be plenty of teams looking to fill those kind of bottom roles. Everyone's always looking for that extra kind of depth defenseman anyways. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting if maybe some of these guys who we have projected uh, on the lower end here are able to uh, take advantage of the fact that there's a lower supply of players and maybe if we're going to be wrong on some of these contracts, we might be a little bit low on some of these lower-end defensemen because teams see the value in having some of these depth guys. So Luke Shen, we have one year, $1.6 million. Um, how, how do we kind of get there? Luke Shen, we, we've got him at one year, uh, about $1.5 million. And that's a cap hit percentage of 1.87%. And a player like him, he's probably a penalty kill guy on your team, but he's very low-key strong at 5v5. And that's something that's really important for your bottom pairs. You don't want them to be hurting you when they're out on the ice. That style of player that Luke Shen is, contract comparables... Some that are a little bit higher would be like a Braden Coburn when he signed in Tampa Bay. Um, a Derek Englund is slightly lower, but I, w- I would say about the same. Nick Holden is another player who is, historically has been a stronger bottom pair defenseman that can help on your penalty kill. Those type of players... They're not going to make anyone super excited when they get signed to their team, but they're very important. Yeah, you don't want to be uh, an injury or two away from uh, not having the experience, especially down on the sh- down the stretch for some of these, uh, especially on defense. Um, if you're looking to make a long cup run, so some of the other interesting names on this list that we kind of glazed over, and I think we glazed over them because I'm not sure what's going to. I'm not really sure how they're going to shake out. I think maybe three of the hardest, three, four of the hardest players to project are pretty are pretty towards the top here. Gosses Bear, Klingberg, Doomba, Doomlin. Yeah, so when I'm looking at this list and I gloss over those players, it's kind of because if I was running a team, I'd probably stay away from those players. And it's not to say they can't provide good value. I think it's more that you're not really sure what you're going to get. Of those four names, and he is at the top of those four names, Gosses Bear, I'm a little more comfortable with him. I think he can fit a good offensive role, especially next to someone who is more of a 
responsible defender in his own zone. And Gus Despair can definitely help on your power play if you need it. Klingberg, offensively, he can still provide a little. He either forgot how to play defense or he doesn't care to play defense, at least in Anaheim. Going below that, Dumba, he's had some injuries in past years that have made me feel a little hesitant as far as signing him to a deal like we have projected, three years, 4.4. Uh, his offensive ability has kind of gone down a bit too, and th- that's a player that you can hope he rebounds. I don't know if he's going to. I think he's a name that uh, people would be kind of interested to hear how we got there because some people are still really high on Matt Dumba, and and I could talk myself into him. Um, he brings a physical presence. He can skate. He's got a really good shot. But yeah, the de- defensive deficiencies have been there a little bit. The injuries have been there. I think he's. I think if there's a player kind of in this group that maybe fans, teams might try and talk themselves into a little bit more is Matt Dumba because the last couple of years in Minnesota haven't been great, but before that he was a really strong player. Yeah, so I think if he, he were to hit the market, let's say two years ago, where he was having some stronger seasons, the offensive ability was on the score sheet. He's probably looked at in like a Jeff Petrie, maybe, uh, I I don't want to say Giordano, because that's a much, I think he's a much more elite defenseman earlier in his career. But he's someone who you could talk yourself into playing on your power play for sure. Now, I think... Because of those injuries he's had, I, I believe I want to say it was a shoulder injury that he had that seems to really be limiting his offensive ability. I think he's finding himself more in the range of the Josh Manson, the Connor Murphy, let's say on the low end, maybe a Adam Larson when he signed his deal in Seattle. That's the type of player who can maybe still be solid on the second pair, but maybe that high end ability is starting to kind of go away. Yeah, that, that's that's really one someone that think of all these names on this list. I'm most interested in him. Um, cut off, I wouldn't be shocked if he kind of signs a one year contract some, somewhere, gets some money, tries to reestablish himself value wise in a really good situation. Um, Maybe someone like Buffalo, where he could slot in on their second pair, probably wouldn't get power play time there. But he would he would uh, have a little, would have a really really strong partner that might help boost his play. And then that team just puts up goal after goal on the ice anyway. So he might be able to add some box score numbers too. Yeah, so that fit specifically he wouldn't get power play time, but he would get power time. Yeah, I can't be the only funny man on this podcast, I guess. He. Pretty much would slide right in on that second pair next to Owen Power. And if you are looking to reset your value, Buffalo would be a great situation for a defenseman. You would most likely go in there with the eye of that second pair next to Owen Power. And that's a very, very offensive team. And if you're looking to kind of pad the box score stats, the goals and assists, that's a great situation to put yourself in. From Dumba's perspective, I would be interested in that opportunity. I don't know if that would necessarily be the exact fit Buffalo's looking for, but it's definitely possible. Dumba's defensive ability hasn't necessarily gone away. It's more that the offensive flair that he had earlier in his career is starting to fizzle a little bit, but it could still be there reignite it so yeah the with with Matt Dumba and then Brian Dumlin he Pittsburgh fans were not a big fan of his by the end of the past season or two but his numbers at least his play driving numbers are still okay they're not he's not an elite first pair defense anymore but maybe he's that uh extra left that kind of next left shot d guy that slots in on a middle pair yeah, I think if Brian Dumoulin is, let's say, your fourth defenseman, you're you're doing pretty good. 
I, I think there's a lot of fans that are kind of, they want all their defensemen to be very, very good defensemen. And there's a lot of teams that don't even have a true number one yet. When you're looking at building out defensive depth, obviously you, you don't want to put someone like Dumoulin in your your top pair. He's going to skate 26 minutes a night. But if he's your, let's say, fourth defenseman, you're, you're doing pretty well. He's performing at least an average role right now, and that, that's kind of what you're looking for in that spot. So I think maybe one of the tougher projections here, and, and a very interesting name on this list, is a player who put up numbers for a good chunk of the season, then was traded for significant value, then basically rode the bench. Eric Gustafson, Toronto, when he was with Washington, he was on fire putting up the numbers that would get him paid maybe even higher than Dmitry Orlov this year, and then hardly played in Toronto uh, and was at best their seventh defenseman in the playoffs, and Toronto gave up some really nice pieces, a really nice young defenseman, Rasmus Sandin, that maybe they could have used down the stretch themselves. So the interesting thing with what Toronto did, so they, they added Gustafson, McCabe, and Shen. I don't know if there was another one, but still adding three defensemen at the deadline, or midseason at least. It, teams don't usually do that. And yeah, Gustafson kind of ended up being the odd man out there. I almost want to say maybe Toronto was kind of smart that they loaded up on defensemen in case there were injuries. They had a very, very solid Eric Gustafson on the bench in case they needed him. Um, the weird thing with Gustafson is he, he kind of burst onto the scene. It was the 2018-2019 season with the Chicago Blackhawks. He had a 60-point season. And People were thinking he was going to be their top pair guy of the future. And the following season, uh, not quite as good. Um, and he ended up being moved to Calgary. And from there, he bounced around Philadelphia, Montreal, back to Chicago for a year. Got a one-year deal with Washington and started to see that offensive ability again. Washington kind of had a thinner defense due to some injuries and they also moved Orlov um, I think just before Gustafson so maybe not a whole lot of time there for Gustafson to move up the lineup but he performed very well 38 points for Washington and in the nine games he saw with Toronto in the regular season he still had four points for a defenseman like Gustafson his true value is going to be offensive and he seems to have kind of found that touch again. So who who do we have driving that three year, you know, almost three point well, three point four million dollar AAV because we talk about building a market basket of players as comparisons and that seems like what we have to do here because the range of outcomes for Eric Gustafson is pretty wide. Again, with Gustafson, he's he's an offensive defenseman. That's where his strength really lies. Um, some comps that were a little bit higher, and I think more consistent in their careers as far as offensive defensemen, it's Kevin Shattenkirk and Tyson Berry. Um, their deals were right around 4.5%, um, or Berry was 4.5%. Shankirk about 4.75. Those were a little high for the cap hit percentage. Gustafson we have at 4.09%. Some guys that might be pulling them down a little bit, but still some more offensive ability there. Justin Schultz, when he signed in Seattle, that was a 3.64 uh, cap hit percentage. And... In a way, I would say Travis Hamnick. Not quite as much, but he had a little offensive ability. Uh, sign in Vancouver at a 3.64 cap hit percentage. I don't like that one quite as much as Justin Schultz or the Kevin Shattenkirk and Tyson Berry. But uh, th those are 
comparable defensemen, uh, all offensive defensemen that are really able to play power play minutes for you. Unrestricted defenseman class is going to be really interesting to watch and kind of looking at some of the names and the teams that they're kind of finished the season with. I don't necessarily see anyone else signing before July 1st kind of hits. It would be pretty surprising if any of the top names more towards the top uh, kind of re-sign there. So this, this marketplace is probably going to move really, really quickly on July 1st as teams start to kind of position themselves for the t- uh, players that they're hoping fills that specific role because there really are guys to fill everything. You need a, you know, right shot D while well, there's, there's some really good ones for second, third pair out there. You need a left shot, middle pair defense when there's a couple guys there, some really nice depth guys there as well. The class will be really interesting to monitor. So with that, we would like to thank you for listening to our third episode of the max term podcast. Please Follow us on Twitter at AFP Analytics or at Max Term Pod. Any questions that you have for either James or I, you're always welcome to hit us up on Twitter at either of those two handles or either of our personal handles, which we have uh, pinned with the at AFP Analytics contract projections on that uh, Twitter feed. And uh, we'll talk to you next time.